Ruthless invaders, a defenseless planet. Battle beyond the stars. A lone youth escapes on a last ditch mission that begins at the edge of the universe. story of a boy who finds more than he expected. <laughs> Make them burn. And all he can handle. Does your species have kissing? Oh, yes. We have that. Try one. That's a hot dog. It comes from Earth. Do you like it? There's no dog in this. Mm -mm. Soybean meal? Niacin, dextrose, and sodium nitrate flavoring. That's what we call meat back home. Battle Beyond the Stars. Starring Richard Thomas, George Papard, Robert Vaughn, John Saxon, <laughs> A battle beyond time, beyond space. I said fire! That ends in a desperate gamble. They'll be able to board us. It won't make any difference. Get that hatch open! No! Battle beyond the stars. of the atom only a few decades ago, and through his God-given genius of science, man, at last, has succeeded in penetrating further and further into the unknown vastness of space. The moon has become the launching base for advanced exploration. From this pivotal point, astronauts, at the risk of their lives, set out to conquer nature's mysterious forces. Yet many questions remained unanswered. What is his Earth in relation to the inconceivable number of other worlds? Is his speed truly the fastest? His achievements the greatest? Or is he a mere unimportant piece of driftwood floating in the vast ocean of the universe? Could there be life similar to our own on other planets? Is it not possible that atmospheric conditions of relative environments control their shapes and forms? If so, would they be giants? Or could perhaps the opposite be true? Could their intellect have reached a scientific level far above man's dream? What then will the future reveal if this story you are about to witness is only the beginning? Log entry, Pegasus 3, March 16, 1980. Captain Leonard Pilot, Lieutenant Webb Navigator. This is the seventh and last day of space reconnaissance research, Flight 361 from United States Air Force Lunar Base 1. We are 21,000 miles from base, bearing at 270 degrees, 
two, three minutes. Azimuth at plus 46 degrees, 46 degrees, 50 oh minutes, ecliptic. On routine successive approximation by trajectory computer using data from the space position recorder. It's quiet and lonely out here. And frankly, we'll be happy to get back to that dreary old moon. We're almost a degree off trajectory, Captain. Equipment check's okay. Must be an outside acceleration force. Something approaching fast. I'm setting up auto evasive pattern. A large planetoid object is on a direct collision course with us. We are under 11 G's exterior acceleration and have no control whatsoever. Just incredible. Two ships missing in less than a month. Nothing within thousands of miles of their position. And yet they crash into something that appears suddenly on our radar, big enough to be a planet. And then the next instant it disappears. It's against all theories of space. You get the same reports from bases two and three. It appeared for a second or two, then vanished completely. A ship is on a routine flight. Controls, rocket, everything in order. And then all of a sudden, Yes. General Gibson for Colonel Lansfield from Earth headquarters. Stand by. Colonel Lansfield. Lansfield, what's all the trouble up there? General, I can't tell you any more than what was in that report this morning. You're certain the rockets crashed? I am. We have their last log entry through our recording reproduction unit. Now, General, I've listened to it over and over. It tells what happened, but not how and why. What do you suggest? I don't know, General. No doubt the rocket's destroyed. We don't know what we're looking for. This mysterious planet seems to come and go at such speeds, it's impossible to track. Phantom planet, Lansfield. You're a little old to think that, aren't you? This is a capable base, General, run by capable men. Now, there's something out there that isn't supposed to be. All right, all right, take it easy. Send another reconnaissance with Chapman. Chapman? I need him for the Mars project. If this phantom planet thing isn't cleared up, there won't be any Mars project. Send him. Yes, sir. Ask Chapman to report. Yes, sir. Captain Chapman, report to the Colonel. Sure, I've been 
been testing the pressure equipment for the Mars project. Forget about that now, Chapman. You leave tomorrow morning. Does General want someone with your experience? I don't know whether to feel flattered or not. What exactly will I be looking for? A floating space monster? This is no joke, Frank. I wish it were. Sorry, sir. You know how rumors move around this base. Well, it's one of the things we hope that you'll dispel. Well, you're the colonel. I'll take a crack at anything once. And that's about all you'll get, Frank. One crack. miles out at 270 degrees azimuth and 47 degrees ecliptic. Speed, 4.6 miles per second. Check. Computer guidance on. Building course on. Direction of rocket support off. Direction of rocket starboard off. Steps automatic. Check. That does it, Captain. We can relax a bit now. Takeoff's always the same. My heart pounds like a sledgehammer. Yeah, mine too. How about the screen? Never fails to fascinate me from up here. You know, Captain, every year of my life, I grow more and more convinced that the wisest and best is to fix our attention on the good and on the beautiful. If you'll just take the time to look at it. Yes, some guy, McConnell. Lunar Base 1 to Pegasus 4. Lunar Base 1 to Pegasus 4. Can you read me? This is Pegasus 4 to Lunar Base 1. This is Lieutenant McConan. Colonel Lansfield for Captain Chapman. Chapman standing by. Anything out there, Frank? Nothing, Colonel. It's almost too quiet. Well, keep alert. And don't waver off your course one degree, unless you think you're on to something. And if you do get on to something, report at once. Yes, sir. Pegasus 4 to Lunar Base 1. Over. Out. I hope whatever was out there is gone now. What's our last time from base? 14 hours, 22 minutes, and 30 seconds. You could stay up here another 14 hours and still see nothing. Even 1,400 hours. That's about all we can do, though. Are you sure we're still on course? Why? Well, I have an idea. Turn to 278 degrees azimuth. 047 degrees ecliptic. Yes, sir. Changing course to 278 degrees azimuth, hold 47 degrees ecliptic. Lansfield tells us to charter the same course Pegasus 3 took. Well, that's fine, but I don't think we'll get anywhere. This strange planet dashes about like it's supposed to. It figures we won't find it around here. So we're changing course. Lightning never strikes twice in the same place. Precisely. You with me? Like I said, you're the captain. I'll Thanks. take a new reading. Thanks, Ray. Go nuts out here just waiting for something to happen. You seem pretty much at ease. Well, I figure it's just the same as fishing. You've got to be patient and wait. Electrostatic meters going haywire. Lunar Base 1 to Pegasus 4. Can you read me? Over. Pegasus 4 to Lunar Base 1. We read you. Over. You are completely off course, Pegasus 4. Check your position immediately. Computer and spectrometer out. Pegasus 4 to Lunar Base 1. We are aware of being off course. Cannot explain at present. We are entering a heavy magnetic field. Several instruments are out and I'm afraid others are going. Give us our exact position. Over. Pegasus 4, you are... Cannot hear you, Lunar Base 1. Over. Changing to the manual control. Meteor. Yet. We're in a semi 
opposing course with them. Scream one's fading fast. What about the infrared detector? That's out too. The thing we can do is turn it 90 degrees to the shower's path. More meteors are coming, it's our only chance. That will be to 311 degrees azimuth and minus 12 degrees ecliptic. Here they come. This is it. Now, those are ionized trails. They'll persist for a while. Well, let's hope for no strike. Get these instruments out. There won't be any way to tell if they're coming from another direction. The trick now is to get back to the moon. I think we'll make it. Yeah. Okay, Ray, let's go through a tight B check. Right. Cabin pressure? 20 coming up. Petro port? Positive. Petro starboard. Positive. Main circuit one. Negative. Main two. Negative. Now let's try the auxiliaries. Main one. Negative. Main two. That's not in the circuit. You know, the meteors must have smacked into the propulsion elements. Our feed lines. Yeah, we're lucky. Well, there's only one way to find out. Looks like it. You know, there's one thing sure. What's that? They knew what they were doing when they forced us to go through those space drills dozens of times. If I remember correctly, you had a different opinion. <laughs> they don't rub it in. Thank <laughs> you. 
hallowed be thy name. With all respect to the Colonel, sir, I don't think it's any use. Keep working that radar and keep working it until we locate Chapman. Yes, sir. He's got to be out there somewhere. He just has to be. Lieutenant Chapman, pilot, Pegasus Four. My ship is being drawn toward an asteroid. Instruments completely out of operation. Navigator McConan, lost. I cannot read my position. I'm going to try to land. I don't think I'll make it. If I do, I'll continue recording.
our size. Yes, Thank you, Sesson. Bring in the jurors. Will Ipsalata step forward? the prisoner. Stand here, in front of our leader and our judge. Is the prisoner from another world ready to hear the charges against him? Charges? What charges? I will ask the questions. Are you ready to stand trial? It seems I have no choice. First, I want to know what I'm charged with. We'll let you know in time. What are you called? Chapman. Frank Chapman. What is your occupation in the world from which you come? I'm a captain in the Air Force of the United States, a country on Earth, space exploration wing. But you must know about us. You speak our language. We do not speak it. But here on Rayton. Rayton? Yes, Rayton. The name of our planet. Here we are able to translate all languages through voice tone waves. Why all these explanations? Let us go on with the charges. You're right, Heron. This is no time for explanations. Man from Earth, you are accused of causing injury to one of our people. I thought I was being attacked and I defended myself. I didn't want to come to your world. I lost control of my ship. It was like being pulled toward your planet by an enormous gravitational force. You were, when you came into our path of travel. Path of travel. Phantom planet. We managed just in time to control your landing by releasing the pressure in our space warp. I don't understand. There are many things you will not understand here. Maybe in time you shall. In time? That is correct. The jury will now vote and find you guilty or not guilty for inflicting injury on a Rayton man. I 
find you guilty as charged. You are now a free subject of Rayton. The jury is dismissed. That is all. You are now a free subject of Rayton. That is not all. Listen, I don't know what kind of a place this is, but you must have some kind of law here. This planet pulled me to it. I didn't come here by choice. But being here, you cannot be permitted to leave. We must keep our security at any cost. So, I must pronounce you guilty. No penalties will be lodged against you. But you must become a subject of Rayton. Trial is concluded. Nothing is concluded. What is this? First I'm found guilty of something that's not my fault, and then I'm set free. Well, free to go where? Back to my world six inches tall? Don't worry. No harm will come to you. I'm Liara, Sesam's daughter. I'll show you to your quarters. Well, come. We'll talk on the way. What has happened to me? You mean your size? Well, our atmosphere, together with some acceleration from our gravitational control, has reduced you to normal. Normal? Normal for us. You see, everything here is in proportion to our planet's size. Uh, we know several worlds that have creatures larger or smaller according to the size of their world. Do you feel any different? No, but it's not exactly funny to think that someone on Earth could carry me about in their pocket. Oh, well, that would never happen. The oxygen in your atmosphere would restore you immediately to your regular size. But either way, it wouldn't matter. You'll never see your world again. Nothing yet? No, sir. No contact for two days. I'll wait another 24 hours. Then, with or without orders, I'm sending out a search party. You wanted to see me? Yes. Will you excuse me? We must talk about your future. Your future on Rayton. My future on Rayton? I want to talk about getting back to my world, back to Earth. I'm afraid that is impossible. You might as well accept your fate, your fate of being one of us. Being one of us, you must be productive in one way or another. Well, what is it you want me to do? You must help us to keep spaceships from your world from landing here. But that's my only hope of getting back. Forget about it. Two ships in my unit disappeared. Did they crash here? Unfortunately, yes. They were pulled into our strong gravitational field. Well, so was I. Yes, but luckily we were aware of your approach. It lowered the power on our gravity field. I don't get it. In many ways, you're hundreds of years ahead of our science. Yet you live in such a primitive manner. It may not be as odd as it seems. It's true that our technology may be much further advanced than yours, but then strange thing happened. Well, what was that? We had machines do all our work. People on Rayton became completely free of all labor. Practically of all responsibilities. Our people became soft and lazy. They did not know how to cope with their free time. They started to fight amongst themselves. That's very interesting. Many people on Earth are beginning to face the same problem. Too much free time, too little work. Mm. Problem not at all unique in the history of the universe. Well, what happened on Rayton? Our forefathers then made a wise decision. They returned to, as you say, our primitive ways. The Raytons again had to toil for their living. They became much stronger, much happier, much more valuable. But you didn't forsake all of your scientific achievements. No, we retained the secret of the gravity control for our survival in space and the secret of our food production for our survival on this barren planet. You sacrificed advancement for this. Sesame rules us and we are content. 
Now, can't we get on with this, Cecil? Aaron is hasty. We all are. Our lives have been changed so much. I would like you to become acquainted with our ways. Later, you may choose a wife. Liara or Zetha. Zetha cannot speak, but she is a fine woman. Well, between the two, it would be difficult to make a choice. It is no problem. You may take your time, but once you've made your choice, remember, it must not be taken lightly. You must be hungry. Come with me. They are. Go now and learn our ways. And perhaps you may help us with our problems. You can decide about this later. Now you need to eat and rest. of your breadfruit. We made it chemically for you since nothing grows here on this planet. Oh, here. Drink this. It's good for you and it'll help to make you rest. You need it. Say nothing grows here. Well, then how do you exist? Well, our bodies are so constructed that we need very little food because of the air we breathe. Feeling better now? I hope so. Yes. But I'd like to get out of here. You're a strange one, Frenchman. I'm a strange one. What about everybody else? And don't call me Frenchman. My name is Frank Chapman. Two words. Yes. Frank Chapman. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be so rough. It's just that well, this is so new to me. You know what I'd like to do if I had a choice? What? I'd like to return to my ship. <laughs> well, that's impossible. Then you see, I'm still a prisoner. Not at all. You're free to go anywhere here on Rayton. Except to my ship. Your rocket is no longer on this planet. It was sent off last night while you were sleeping. I cannot rate my position. I'm going to try to land. I don't think I'll make it. If I do, I'll continue recording. This is Captain Frank Chapman, pilot of Pegasus IV. My ship is being drawn toward an asteroid. The instrument's completely out of operation. Navigator McConan, lost. Unidentified object on screen. This must be Chapman's ship, Colonel. Certainly has all the indications and all the characteristics of a spaceship. And no other unit of ours is scheduled for flight in this area. Any contact? None, Colonel. Just static. His auto-emergency transmitter should be on full blast. I'm tuned to all Pegasus frequencies, sir. So are the automatic relays on Earth. Good. This must be Chapman's ship. What else can it be? Captain Beecher and Lieutenant White are to report to the briefing room immediately and stand by for takeoff. Now report immediately. Any news or anything unusual on you? Radio and radar relay. Yes, Colonel. The rescue ship is in the countdown phase, sir. They're waiting for your final operation orders. Put me through to the captain of the rescue ship on launching. Yes, sir. Beecher. This is Lansfield. Yes, Colonel. Major, your final instructions are being teletyped on your recorder. Yes, sir. As you know, something unusual must have happened to Chapman and McConan. And I don't mind telling you that it's of greatest importance to space travel that we find out exactly what happened to these two men. So blast off and good luck. We'll do our best, Colonel.
try to land. I don't think I'll make it. If I do, I'll continue recording. This is Captain Frank Chapman, pilot, Pegasus IV. My ship is being drawn toward an asteroid. The instrument's completely out of operation. Navigator McConan, lost. Pegasus IV to Luna Base One. Pegasus IV to Luna Base One. This is Captain Beecher, over. Luna Base One to Pegasus IV. We read you, Captain Beecher. Good work. Stand by for Colonel Lansfield. Beecher, how are they? They're not. I mean, there's no one on board. There isn't a sign of life. Two men just don't get up and walk off a rocket in the middle of space? No, sir. Then what the devil? Chapman recorded a final message, sir. But it doesn't make sense. Our repro units are picking it up. We're examining it. Can you bring her in? I'll have to check out the instruments. But I think so. All right, give it a try. White can bring your ship in. Yes, sir. And Beecher. Yes, sir. Good luck. work under these conditions. I must know more about the directional flight machine. When the time comes. Well, the time has come. I want to speak to Sesson. And right now. Very well. Father. Frank Chapman wishes to speak with you. Do you want to talk about Liara? That isn't what I came here to discuss. My work has reached a stage and I need to know more about your gravity control. It is too soon. Now, how do we know he's not a spy for the solarites? You are too distrusting, Heron. All right. You may see it. The density of our planet made it possible for us to advance gravity and, therefore, anti-gravity theories. It's beyond me. Einstein was working on this problem, but he died before he could complete his investigations. What causes Rayton's high density? The atoms on this planet have narrower electronic orbits than the atoms on most other planets. The smaller they become, easier it is for us to control and take advantage of positive and negative gravity. But why is Rayton getting smaller? This planet is slowly using up the energy that holds the atomic particles together. You mean you might disintegrate into nothing? Yes, someday. But it will not be in our time. Well, I guess it's the same as on Earth. We don't seem to worry that our sun might be cooling off in many millions of years. Uh, the danger for us is that sudden bursts of concentrated heat directed on our ray ton might suddenly speed up the process of time. You think that's possible? And we have enemies who want our knowledge of gravity and who know our weakness. You're expecting an attack? When you have enemies, you always expect an attack. I've had a chance to talk to you alone. How is it your 
more different than the others. I don't mean your silence. I, I mean you're warm or uh, more sensitive. That wasn't really a question, because I know you can't answer. I just wanted you to know how I feel. It's a strange world. I don't want to hurt Leah. You don't either. charges to make against the Earthman Chapman. He is imposing himself both on Liara, your daughter, and the mute girl, Zetha. Now, this is an insult to Liara. You know I love her. And a direct insult to me. I am asking. Rather, I am demanding your permission to challenge him to the duel. sent for me? Yes. I have reports about you that are not good. That you're causing much trouble. What am I supposed to have done now? You are forcing your attentions on Liara. And then on the mute girl, Zeta. That's not true. Why don't you ask them? He lies. Siren. Is it true? Has he forced himself or his attentions upon you? Why would she admit it? Perhaps she's afraid of it. Being mute, she's unable to defend herself. Maybe she's protecting me. Listen, I'm not going to be put on trial or questioned by you or anyone else for something I haven't done. You know, buddy, I don't like you. Maybe it's a carryover from Earth and not good taste. But I'd like to hang one on you. Chapman, Aaron has challenged you to the duel of Rayton. Do you accept his challenge? A duel for what? What kind of a duel? This guy doesn't look very honest to me. A duel of bravery. You know, Mr. Sesson, maybe this duel business is a good idea. Might clear the air a little. So how do we go about it? Aaron, you know the rules for the duel of Rayton. But for him, I'll have to explain and show the results. Chapman, come here. Those are gravity plates that we've had placed here. Their intensity is so high that any object or any person placed on any one of them would immediately disintegrate. Here, let me show you. Rayton is one of physical strength and skill. You will use this rod and attempt to push your opponent on top of one of the gravity plates. You saw what happened to the rock. Get ready. Put the combat rod in position. my signal, you will start the duel. There can be no quarter called and no quarter given. The fate of the victim is in the hands of the victor. The moment has come. At my light signal, you will proceed.
kill you. I never did. Killing him would have accomplished nothing. But Heron wouldn't have shown you mercy. He'd have killed you because he wants me. But I don't love him. I love you. If you'd felt anything for either one of us, you could have stopped this duel. What? You know what I think? I think you were waiting to see which one of us won and then take the one that was left over. What? No, Liara, I don't love you. I don't even know if I like you. But let me tell you this. You can't make someone love you. It's got to come naturally. You, you can't force it, you can't command it. If you do that, you'll never find it. Oh, this, this whole thing is, is like a nightmare to me. I miss my people. Well, I've got to make some attempt to get back. And if you feel anything for me, you'll try to help me. Well, perhaps you're right. Maybe I can help you. As you said, I don't want to kill you. I think I could understand your somewhat quaint language if I were on your earth a little. Well, why don't you kill me? You didn't kill me. You had the chance. Well, what about the knife? This isn't exactly what I'd call a friendly visit. If you help me, I have a plan whereby I might help you to leave our planet. Perhaps it will work. I don't see how this is possible. What about my size? I inspected your giant suit. And the oxygen tank holds air from your own world. Now, isn't that right? Yes, of course, but why? No, never mind that. That's not important. You see, the whole plan is based on the theory that your people are searching for you. Now, I must get you back before they attempt to find you here. I know they've been searching and will eventually zero in on this planet. I think I can get you back in time. Yes, but... Uh... You're doing this because of Liara, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm in love with her. I don't think she loves me yet, but... Uh, perhaps with you gone, she will see things in a more realistic light in time. Well, how can we get my suit into the open? I have some men I can trust. Incessant? No. Oh. You must never know. Otherwise, we both will be put to death. Two nights a week, I'm alone. In complete charge of the master control center. Can one man handle it? Yes. And on one of those nights in the near future, while Sesame is sleeping, I will maneuver Raytown within a distance of your Earth's moon. You think they'll be able to see us? Precisely. They will investigate and find you. What's happening? The siren means we're being attacked. Attacked by whom? Attacked by whom? The Solarites. We've been here too long. They've discovered our position. Who are the Solarites? I have no time to explain. I must help Cecil. What will this do to our plans? We must fight this off or no one will have any plans. Is everyone underground? Yes. Let me go. This is safe for the moment. 
moment. And I fear they won't give up so easily. Safe for the moment? Well, who are these solarites, anyhow? They are from a sun satellite. For generations, they've been after our universal gravity control because they want to avoid being pulled into the sun. If we don't stop them, they'll eventually attack your Earth. Liara, show him the prisoner. Prisoner? Come. during the last war. The only one of their monsters that didn't die in the attack. When did this attack take place? Several years ago, when Zetha was a little girl. That's when she lost her voice. What makes those rocks disintegrate? It's as if they were hitting some invisible wall. But that's exactly what it is. The monster is so strong that he can smash any ordinary structure. Now, what you call an invisible wall is really another way that we use our gravitational control. Now, by using a high magnetic field, we can lock molecules so closely together that they form a solid wall. Make a big hit at MIT. Where? One of Earth's more advanced centers of learning. I only hope your wall will, will hold him in check. Yes. He could kill us all if he escaped life on other planets. And we were always wondering if ours was the only one so blessed. There are many inhabited worlds, but only these fire people bother us. We have been sighted by the enemy. They are forming a concentrated attack pattern six, vernier index one, two. And six? They never attacked on that one before. What are we going to do? We must try to break up the attack. things. Outrun them or fight them. Well, breaking up a formation is one thing, but how can you fight them? Do you have a chance? We have to settle that once and for all. Living in constant danger isn't worthy of us. But don't forget, we still have the gravity control. The greatest danger to us is the high intensity heat bomb. That's right. They have enough concentrated heat to blow up our planet instantly. What would you do? I would fight. And you? Fight. Right. That's exactly my decision. Prepare for battle. Sharp acceleration for attack position. Maneuver so that we face the enemy when they attack. Aaron, 
Alert our units to be ready for frontal attack. All units, prepare for frontal attack. Activate the gravity curtain. Deeply plagued with regret when I'm forced to destroy. If it wasn't them, it would have been you. Perhaps you are right. You're wise, Chapman. One day you and Harrod will lead our people. Well, I'm honored and grateful, I but... I will teach him all he needs to know. Zeta. She went to sleep early. Sleep? I'm very tired. Perhaps the battle was too much of a strain on me. Good night. Good sleep night, well, Father. Zeta.
Madeline. Oh, I think it was a solarite. Are you all right? I... What happened? I don't know. Was it the solarite? Did I you see him? It was terrible. Bless him. He will be all right. The aura is with him. I'm glad. You still wish to return to your world? Yes, but... Well, then tonight's the best time. See, the chaos of battle has brought us closer to your moon than we've ever been. It'll be a simple task to maneuver Raton slowly and steadily even closer, and the risk will not be so great because the travel time will be short. And we'll be well within the range of moon's radar. Yes, but we cannot go unnoticed. Now, as soon as we're within range of your moon, my men will carry your suit out into the open. Now, if your people come to investigate, Pull them into our gravity and direct their landing. Meanwhile, you will enter your suit, seal it up, so that you're not exposed to our atmosphere and all the rest you know. Where shall I meet you? In the control chamber. Someone will come for you. Lisa. It's you. Yes, Frank Chapman. But you can talk. From my fright, when I thought you were going to be killed, something happened. And after I screamed, I found I was able to speak. Say so. I have many things to say to you, Frank Chapman. It's so wonderful you being able to talk. And I have so many things to say to you. Oh, everything has been terrible. You're so lovely. You have such an adorable little face. in love with you since the first time I saw you. And I've never been able to speak a word of it until now. But as I know, my love for you is so strong. So I also know that you will leave. I must leave.
Good. You're on time. Here we go. Another hour and we shall be close enough for you to be found. This is rocket ship 380 to Luna Base 1. Over. Radar has just picked up a giant asteroid. Identity unknown. Cannot find any record of it in the space chart. The Phantom Planet. Give us exact position of asteroid. Nine degrees in northern cluster field. And I have an order from Colonel Lansfield. You are to land on this asteroid and send White to investigate. I... I hope you will find happiness back with your people. You would be my happiness. Here or there. Frank Chapman, please. You must take the stone. It will be a good luck charm. Hold on to it. It will help you to go back safely to your people. Keep it. And remember, Mac. I love you. Yes, Eva. I'll keep it forever. Just confirmed it. A rocket similar to yours is heading in our direction. I hope it won't crash. <laughs> Don't worry. I have the best man on gravitation control. And I have another man who's coming to help me turn on the oxygen tanks as soon as you're in your suit. Thank you, Han. You know, we've become friends here. Good friends. We would have become friends anywhere. Your planet or my Earth. I wish you and Liara much happiness. Come in, White. I found Chapman. He's alive. But there's no trace of McConan. Where's McConan? He's dead. He's gone. Back to the ship. White to Beecher. I'm bringing him in. He seems to be all right. He said McConnell is dead. He keeps talking about other people. I think he's in a state of shock. Do you need assistance? No, Captain. I can handle him alone. You know, Frank, you're a lucky guy. This is a wandering planet. Could have carried you anywhere. I'm sure glad we found you. Zeta. Where is she? What you need is a rest.
prepare for immediate takeoff. How do you feel, Chad? I don't know. I don't understand. It's unbelievable. We'll get you back to Moon Base for a thorough examination. Do you think you're hurt? I don't think so. You must have been knocked out for quite a while. I must have been dreaming. Quite possible you were delirious. The shock of the crash landing of your ship. Ray's gone. But I just left Zeth in hand. Ready for firing. Stand by for countdown. The gravity of this planetoid is very strong. We'll need every bit of thrust for our takeoff. Don't worry. I know we're going to make it. Start your countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Gentlemen, go, go for a wild, wild ride with the Watusi cats. But beware, the sweetest kittens have the sharpest claws. For your own safety, see faster pussycats. Kill, kill. Wild women, wild wheels. Race the fastest pussycats and they'll beat you to death. Superwoman, belted, buckled, and booted. <laughs> Yourself on this kid, and hanging it up for nothing. For nothing? She's got nothing to do with the money. She is the money. Jack and Jill, they make the mafia look like brownies. Hey, he's a big one, ain't he? Mm. Got muscles all the way to his ears. Yeah. 10% of your action be enough for anyone. Too much for one man to handle. And again, you never can tell. You girls a bunch of nudists, or you just uh, short of clothes? Right now, you're first on my list. And I always try to talk. You've only got one channel. And your channel's busy tuning in outside. You really should be AM and FM. So who do I get to take care of? The muscle man? You got two of everything. And some left over. You did want. You wanted big. Right. Or sigh, darling. Why don't you take one of each, son? They uh, both look tender. He's got a big motor to feed. But give you a youth it is. My motor never runs out, baby. Oh, oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. You were too rough the last time. All right, here's how it works. Everybody's got to go. You name it, we've got it. 
faster pussy cat kills, <laughs> delivers tons more than the opposition. On ladylike karate chops, on gentlemanly haymakers, spirited gymnastics, corrective table etiquette, sandbox jousting, or a muscle-bound cat wrestling with a roaring sports car that's intent upon squashing him like a grape. Bizarre kidney and chassis rattling chases, and for the first time on the screen, a haymaking, belly busting, karate chopping, judo flipping fight to end them all. Superwoman against man. The prize, life itself. Slashing, tackling, gouging, hacking, flipping, belting, smashing, and blasting. Muscle to muscle, bone to bone. For an incredible evening's entertainment, a film so totally satisfying, see Russ Meyer's faster pussycat. Kill, kill. The Burger King himself. Your Highness, exactly what is it you go to Burger King for? Lunch. <laughs> yes, but I mean, is it the Whopper? Thank you. Or the fries? Don't mind if I do. Or the shakes? Chocolate. Sir, what is it that brings you to Burger King? Why, the Royal Motorcycle, of course. <laughs> Burger King, where kids are king. In a future that grows ever closer, the fate of our Earth will lie in the hands of one man, a solitary warrior of great courage. His name is Doge, and he is called the Finder. His enemies will emerge from the underworld to test his strength. Yurok, the Cyclopean warlord of the One Eyes, the Assassin Baal, half man, half machine. Jared Sin, leader and mastermind of the Sinister Renegades. <laughs> they will utilize their cruelest weapons. They will exploit their most mysterious powers. As they create an epic non-stop action adventure movie that will challenge your senses. They will do all this for you in 3D. This summer. Metal Storm. The destruction of Jared Sin in 3D. A warm, sensitive, touching story about the close personal relationship between a man and a woman. Between a trucker oh. and his dog. Fred, I'm so damn tired of picking you up. I got to Fred. Between a father no way. and his son. No way that you could come from my loins. And how they all took to the road one day for a quiet little drive in the country. From Georgia to Texas and back in 28 hours flat with a truckload of bootleg beer. I'll be driving this one. Yeah, yeah. Blocker, blocker. You'll be driving the truck. This is Bandit 1, and that is uh, Bandit 2. <laughs> now, who would do a thing like that? <laughs> You're crazy, you know that? Yeah. You know that? <laughs> yes. Okay, how much money you say it was? dollars Universal presents Burt Reynolds, Sally Field, Jerry Reed, and Fred. We're gonna really have to cook. I mean, put it on the back burner and let's cook. Is that a 10-4? 10-4. And the only thing that stands between them and an $80,000 prize, Jackie Gleason as Sheriff Buford T. Justice. I gotta barbecue your bandit. I got a Smokey report for you. What's your handle, son? My handle is Smokey Bear, and I'm tail grabbing your ass right now. This is Smokey and the Bandit, the story about a lazy weekend in Alabama, Texas, Mississippi, Arkansas, Georgia. Daddy, the top came off. No. 
ain't gonna make it, son. We come this far, ain't we? Look, when we say we're gonna do a job, we do a job. It's me they're after. They don't even know Clint of Snow exists. Oh, they don't. Well, now, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. <laughs> Smokey and the Bandit, proving once and for all, it's not where you're going that counts. It's who the hell's in back of you. You've got to duck it. You've got to keep that key. Duck it. story for the Planetary Chronicle of New York. Ray Peterson reporting. Dateline, December 17th, year 2116. Spaceship Bravo Zulu 88. Destination Galaxy M12. Assignment Outer Space. editor of my paper assigned me to cover a routine check of infraradiation flux on Galaxy M12. The crew members, in order to overcome the earthly gravity, have been subjected to a state of hibernation. That is, the human body put through a congealing process simulating an apparent death. At a preset time, under the impulses of an electric brain, the heart resumes its normal beat. The lungs begin their regular functioning, the blood flowing evenly again. In short, man is reacquiring his earthly faculties. the state of weightlessness caused by lack of gravitation, special magnetic boots are provided to control the balance of space travelers. still in a state of hibernation, the engineer pilot, Al, reported our approach to international satellite Zulu Extra 3-4. Bravo Zulu 8-8 calling Zulu Extra 3-4. Bravo Zulu 8-8 calling Zulu Extra 3-4. Over. Zulu Extra 3-4 to Bravo Zulu 8-8. Go ahead. Contact established. Hibernation period finished. Over. Is that you, Al? Hi, Richard. 
needles to relay? The usual nausea when awakening, my boy. Bravo Zulu 88 has entered orbit of your satellite. Bravo Zulu 88 closing electronic brain. Over. Roger. Everything's in your hands again, Al. Huh. Thanks for nothing, pal. Hey, we got cargo aboard. We've already been informed. Reporter, eh? Did he wake up yet? No, not yet. I haven't brought him his coffee. Bravo Zulu 88 requesting your position. Coordinate Pi 21, over. Okay. I'll send you the reporter as soon as possible. Bravo Zulu 88 closing. Hello, Archie. How you feeling? Man, this time I had a dream. You had a dream? What about? I dreamt I was sleeping. Take over the controls while I wake up the baby. Ah, is it true when we took off you sang him a lullaby? That's right. Just call me Space Wet Nurse. Next time, why don't you just bring a cow along? Yeah, a pacifier would do. Bravo Zulu 88 calling extra 3-4. Over. Go ahead, Bravo Zulu 88. sensation. I didn't know who or where I was until I heard Al's voice. Hi there, spaceman. Hello. This was not my first space flight. Previous assignments for my newspaper had sent me to the moon many times, but never into the vast reaches of deep space. I feared that ten days in a cramped ship with a crew of seven men who would resent a reporter's questions and lack of usefulness might make me an unpopular passenger. The coffin was much too small. Couldn't you have found me a bigger one to sleep in? We didn't have one leech. Why do you call me that? No offense, kid. It just means that here, you're a parasite. Where are we now? Outside. Outside what? Outside everything. Breakfast is served. Bravo, Zulu 88. You're directly in line with us. We'll send you that reporter as soon as possible. Hey, Al, they're asking for the boy. Hey! Calm down, my boy. You'll get along fine. Just control your nerves. There. From now on, you'll be able to hear my instructions. Just remember to regulate your volume now. Hey! You're forgetting the tools of your trade. What's the matter, Sonny? Cut it out, Al. Are you scared, son? Stop treating me like a greenhorn. But that's what you are, my boy. I took the accelerated course before I started on this trip. <laughs> it probably was too quick. I'm not going to take all the air out of the decompression chamber. You'll have an easier exit. I'll give you a count from 20 to 1. Without you go. I know what to do. Son. You don't know anything yet. Don't touch the metal frame around the hatch. Minus 20. Why? Can you see me? No. 
But the first time out, they all behaved the same way. Minus 15. India Zulu 4 1. You ready? 5, 4, oh, wait a second. 2, 1. Out you go! Al was absolutely right. I was scared. The artificial satellite is like an island in the sky. In order not to disturb its calculated orbital chart, we lined up 2,000 feet parallel to it. The only way to get there was to float through the terrifying void between us. central axis. In the ship's cabin, I was met by King 116, the doctor in charge of all crew members' physical and mental health. Take off your space suit and report to the commander. He's waiting for you. Hey, what kind of a guy is our reporter? He still smells earthy. Correspondent Ray Peterson, reporting to the commander. I've heard you're rather famous on Earth. Well, I see my fame has reached the stars. But let me give you a bit of advice. Here among the stars, it is better not to be quite so cocky. You are only here to do a job. Don't worry, that's all I intend to do. On condition that you don't interfere with ours. You've arrived here at a critical moment. So much the better. Peace and tranquility don't have any news value. Sullivan. Yes, sir? How long would it take to reinstall the terminal stages to the spaceship that arrived from Earth just now? That all depends, sir. We only have two mechanics on board. Cancel all rest periods. The ship must be ready as soon as possible. I must go to base 12 on Mars. Yes, sir. You talk about Mars as if it were just down the street. There are no streets here. I firmly oppose your unwelcome visit. Are you trying to flatter me? But the high command refused to listen to me. It's apparent that you have quite a pull there. Not me. But my organization has. Don't forget, Peterson, that everything you put on your tape recorder will have to be sent by me before it's sent back to Earth. 
Here, everything is regulated by machines. You'll find that things are very different here. You may go now. Later on, you'll be shown to your quarters. Working crews ready, sir? Any changes? Hmm? No, Sullivan. Everybody going for a picnic? The working crew's leaving on a space detail. What if I wanted to go along to get some air? You'd have to go and ask the commander for authorization. Is it necessary? Absolutely necessary. Okay. Hoping this special detail might make a good story. I went outside, without permission, to observe and photograph it. This special detail was a refueling operation, one of the most dangerous and delicate operations in space flight. The engineers carried an enormous tube from the space station and carefully attached it to a rear valve on our ship. Thousands of gallons of precious neohydrazine were being pumped into our fuel tanks in order for us to go on to Mars. Look out! The meteorite! Suddenly, I saw a fiery ball racing toward the cosmonaut next to me. Dibley, I pushed him out of the way. But the subsequent reaction caused me to bounce against the connection of the fuel valve, disconnecting it and letting their irreplaceable neohydrazine escape. Close the fuel valve! Five hundred gallons of hydrazine. Lost. I'm sorry. Furthermore, you went without my permission. I said I'm sorry, even though I saved a man's life. You didn't come here to be a hero. The damage you have just caused is much more serious than the mere loss of a life. Evidently, Commander, my way of thinking must seem prehistoric to you. I thought nothing was worse than the loss of a human being. But then I only saved a number. Yankee 1-3. I didn't even see his face. Maybe he hasn't got one. I knew that you were going to give me trouble. I see you're a psychologist, too. Now, look here, Peterson. Let's get this straight. From now on, you must ask permission for everything you do. And you won't ask me for it. That's an improvement. You'll have to ask my second in command. And I'm afraid you'll find that he's tougher than I am. You may go now. You may go. First, Commander, tell me one thing. Why do you deny me the honor of talking to you? I'm leaving, Peterson. King 116. Pardon me for not having called you by name. Allow me. India Zulu 41. What do you want? I'm looking for someone. Excuse me, I'm looking for a number. Yankee 13. He was injured. He should be around here somewhere. Just dismissed. It was nothing but simple shock. Have a look in the biochemical lab. Please excuse my curiosity, Mr. King 116. I come in? Hey, spaceman. Are you addressing me? Yes, but you're a... Go on. You're a girl. 
And you're selling flowers, too. There are no flowers here. These are diaspora. Even with a name like that, they're flowers. section? Sometimes. But I'm really a navigator. When I'm not working with the Astro Compass, I like to substitute for the section chemist. But tell me, why do you want to offer them to me? Oh, no particular reason. Just to celebrate the second smiling face I run into. Al's was the first. And now I find you. Speaking of you, what's your name? I don't mean your numbers, serials, codes, but just your name. Lucy. Lucy. Do you like it? It's not bad. My uncle had a mascot with that name. It was quite cute. I liked it very much. It was a monkey. Thank you. No, really. She was very cute. I meant it as a compliment. Very flattering, Mr. Peterson. Do you know my name, too? Of course. I've already heard about you from George. You know, the commander. My old friend. But doesn't the commander have a number, like everybody else? Not for me. And now, if you'll forgive me, I've got work to do. Yankee one three. I forgot. Thank you, Ray. I really mean it, thanks. Following the order from the commander, Al came over to our ship to pilot a space taxi from which I could photograph a passage of asteroids. India Zulu 4-1, we just made it. I bet you this was the most interesting action shot of your career. Yeah, shooting these rocks is sure something. They're not rocks, my son. They're asteroids, each of them 1,700 feet in diameter. The commander bawled me out for the loss of 500 gallons of hydrazine when I saved a life, and a girl's too. Ah, so you have a weakness for the weaker sex. And she doesn't even call him sir, just George. By all the rates around Saturday, they were right when they called you a meddler. Well, he's ashamed of that. Hold tight now, I'm gonna make a sharp turn. George, you understand him. Is it true that George is leaving? Yes. And Lucy, will she go with him? I'm sorry for you, but that's exactly what she'll do. Something very serious is going on, and all you can talk about is this nonsense. We're leaving for Mars. We? You two, Al? Yes. Can't you tell me more about it? Top secret. Zulu Extra 34 to Space Taxi Bravo 91. Hurry back to base. Over. Roger from Bravo 9-1. Al, can I radio my Earth base? Sure. You think you're still living back in the 21st century? Thanks. You better lower your head now. We're moving back into the satellite. I wanted to join this Mars expedition. Only an order from the high command on Earth could persuade the commander to take me with him. I don't understand. What's making the pilot so late? He promised to join us immediately, sir. Al's really a strange type. He's the best there is. I'm sorry to be late, sir. We've been waiting for you. The situation has become worse. We've got to leave immediately. And you haven't been able to contact Alpha 2? No. Alpha 2 does not answer. We think the pilot may be dead. This could mean the end. That's what I'm afraid of. India Zulu 4-1 wishes to speak with you, sir. Let him talk to the second in command. You take care of him, Sullivan. He refuses to do so. 
He says he has a very urgent communication for you. Send him in. That's all we needed. This inquisitive, interfering meddler. He's a pretty nice guy. Do you think so? This is absurd. Commander, you are insulting the high command. Absolutely against all regulations. Any more criticisms? Yes. So have I, but I keep them to myself. Gentlemen, prepare to leave. Yankee, one three. One moment, please. Yes. What is it, George? That man, Peterson, has persuaded the High Command to let him come with us. It's an order. Aren't you exaggerating? I can't increase the crew. Can't you do without the radio operator? We'll get along just as well. No. I prefer to do without you. Me? I would not want my choice influenced by opinions that are not objective. Anyway, I think I could get along better without a navigator than without a radio operator. If I weren't the navigator, then would you give up taking one with you? Perhaps not. You see, you're not being objective. Besides, I don't want to be left behind, George. It's not that I'd pretend to be of more value than the High Command is, but I'm not of less value either. You aren't giving me an order, are you? No, I'm just begging you. I understand you, George. I know that you always try to be worthy of your position, but you'd be better off if for once you tried... What? ...to be worthy of yourself. I'm sorry, George. Lucy's plea to the commander was effective. When we left the artificial satellite and returned to our spaceship, Bravo Zulu 88, Lucy was aboard and set our course for Mars. Is the nose still turned up? Don't be silly. The nose of a spaceship is always up, even when landing. He's not referring to the spaceship, Al. He's talking about me. My congratulations, Commander. Listen, Peterson. Remember you're extraneous here. So please keep to your place. What place? I don't even have a chair to sit on. Look, there are two cots in there that you can use when we haven't a chance to rest. While the rest of you are working, I'm supposed to sleep. There are times when all children should go to bed. Yeah. Listen, ever since we came on this trip, you've all done your very best to make me feel like an outsider. My congratulations, Peterson. I don't know, sir. It looks like it might be a magnetic storm. Impossible. Listen to the wave boom, sir. Look, Captain. Give me its position. Coordinate 113. Inertial position of object 512. Try to establish contact. It looks like a moonship. 
Bravo Zulu 88. Bravo Zulu 88 to unidentified object over. They're asking for help, sir. Switch to voice circuit. Sierra 1-3, Metro Sierra 1-3 to Bravo Zulu 8-8, over. Bravo Zulu 8-8 to Metro Sierra 1-3, go ahead, over. Tanks are exploded, engines have failed, we are out of control and being attracted to Mars, over. Try to get back into the orbit around Mars, we'll attempt rescue. What caused the explosion, over. Impossible to say, a sudden rush of hot air overpowered us. The instruments have gone crazy. The tanks have exploded. The structure's melted in several places. What about the crew? Three of us left, sir. One dead. The engineer. Put on your spacesuits and stand by for immediate bailout as soon as you enter orbit. Radio out. Disconnect the voice circuit. Do you think they'll make it? That's what I'm checking now. Are you thinking the same thing I am, Al? They can't make it. Why not? No. We won't be able to make it. One of Mars' satellites is crossing our path. Try the engines again. David. 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 Don't. Don't, David. It's suicide. Don't jump. Rescue that poor guy. The captain said so.
nine degrees to starboard. One more and we would have remained here forever. Captain, we're coming in. Lucy, keep the gyros working. As soon as they're inside, we'll get out of here. You stay here and look after it. I'll take care of the engines. Gyros, unlock! Roger. So we get to Mars. We're almost there anyway, aren't we? No. What do you mean, no? We've changed course. We're now heading for Venus. Your what? A direct order from the High Command. And you accepted it? Commander, there's a dying man in there. I don't have to account to you for my actions. Before. Look, Captain. I'm picking up an area of intense heat. It's almost as hot as the photonic field of the sun itself. Turn on the safety system. I think you should tell him, sir. It's no longer top secret. Alpha 2, propelled by photonic energy, is now without a pilot. She is floating in space and is only controlled by the electronic brain. The photonic heat which our radar has picked up has the power of destruction and death. Alpha 2 has re-entered the solar system. During the sun's next revolution, she will start to orbit around the Earth and will destroy it completely, burning everything and eliminating all forms of life. Have we any hope of stopping her? That's why we're going to Venus. It's the nearest point to the elliptical path of Alpha 2. We have but one chance in a million. Our world was in danger, about to be destroyed. Perhaps in a few days, maybe in a few hours, it was up to us. A handful of cosmonauts from Earth, millions of miles away, to try and save humanity. Lucy, you're crying. Dark spots. Those continents. And there are the oceans and the trees. You can't see them. In my mind, I can. I'd like to run down a road that's loud with pine trees. Would you? Yes, and feel just once again the excitement of speed. But we're already running at 90,000 miles an hour. And we're standing still. That's nothing but an illusion. Do you know what day it is? Don't you know that in space we don't count the days? No, but do you know what date it is? It's the 359th of rotation around the sun. That's just part of it. It's Christmas, Lucy. started to land at the interplanetary base on Venus, the largest, best equipped base closest to Alpha 2. From there, Alpha 2 could be intercepted and we hoped destroyed by the remote controlled atomic missiles.
Hey, Archie, is that the base? Yes, right under the protective dome. There's too much hydrogen in Venus's atmosphere. From here, it looks like the glass dome of a temple. You don't need a respirator inside. What about those plugs? Are they purifying filters? Hey, that elevator course is showing results, isn't it? Tell me, why is it that when a man wants to protect himself, he hides himself under a dome? Put on your helmet, kid. I'm going to take you on a quick tour of Venus, only this time it won't be for sightseeing. Emergency action was taken immediately by firing an atomic missile at Alpha-2 in an attempt to destroy this deadly mechanical monster. 8,500. 8,000 miles. 7,500. 7,000 miles. 6,500. 6,000 miles. 5,800. 5,500. 5,200. 5,000 miles. Hold up. Disintegrated. Exactly at 5,000 miles. We'll have a chance to hit her only if the electronic brain which propels her has gone out of control. You see, the two photonic generators which are moving gyroscopically at each end of the spaceship are creating around Alpha 2 an invisible sphere of heat which radiates up to 5,000 miles. We've just had the proof of it. It's indestructible. So one of man's dreams has finally come true. An indestructible destroyer. Unless we have a sudden change in the next solar system revolution, Alpha 2 will start orbiting around the Earth at only 3,500 miles from it. That means 1,500 miles within the safety limit. In a few days, maybe a few hours, our planet will become a mass of boiling mud, as it was soon after its formation. We mustn't give up hope. Something might stop it in time. Maybe a miracle. And while we're waiting here for your miracle, I would suggest we immediately put into operation all the means at our disposal. They've already prepared to fire missiles from the other hemisphere. Meanwhile, why don't you order your men to reach the audio stations on the beach? You stand by electronic telescope number seven. 6,800. 5,700. 5,200. 5,000. 4,500, 4,000, 3,700, 2,900, 2,400, 2,200. I don't understand. With your permission, sir, I have an explanation. What is it? I think I've found the answer. Tell it to us. I'm sure that due to some technical error, that spaceship is vulnerable. The two photonic deflectors at both two hemispheres separated in their fields by a channel. You mean like a halved orange? A perfect example, my son. That's why a missile has gone through. According to you, it was the only one fired exactly into the center of the channel. But why did the last one disintegrate at 2,200 miles? Because of some imperceptible deviation. Perhaps it was attracted by one of the photonic fields. Punch is right, Al. There's still a chance. What chance? we'd have to fire on a straight line from another spaceship traveling alongside Alpha 2 at the same rate of speed. I think I've earned the right to try, sir. Why the right? Because if my hunch turns out to be correct, I'd like to be the one to receive the credit. And if it's wrong, you want to be the one to risk it. There's an old atomic spaceship here, sir. I'll use its remote-controlled missiles. May I go ahead, sir? Yes. And I hope you'll manage to save humanity. We'll take off and follow you as close as possible, Al. All of us. As if we were right there with you. All of us. Hey, Ray. Now you have a chance to do a real exclusive. 
It'll be a universal scoop. Let's just make it a world scoop. Not everybody that can stand 16 gammas. Considering the fact that I'm a parasite. Tango Sierra 13, Tango Sierra 13 to Bravo Zulu 88, over. Al, piloting the old atomic spaceship Tango Sierra 13, flew alongside us. Both spaceships shut off their engines and the inertial thrust allowed them to fly at fantastic speeds. His mission, to find the channel between the two semispheres of Alpha II. Dango Sierra, one three, go ahead. Everything okay, Captain? Perfect. How's the reporter? Doing fine. Requesting route check. Present inertial speed 30,000 miles. Coordinate 13 in respect to Vega. Estimated intersection point with Alpha 2 on coordinate 41 in respect to Earth at 18 degrees. Over. Correct, but change approximately 3 degrees at intersection point with Alpha 2. We'll go. I'll request another route check on approach, and let's hope for the best. Radio out. Satellite Zulu Extra 3-4. Satellite Zulu Extra 3-4, calling Bravo Zulu 8-8. Over. Bravo Zulu 8-8 to satellite. Zulu Extra 3-4, go ahead. Captain, this is Sullivan. What's the trouble, Sullivan? About 45 seconds ago, the photonic field around spaceship Alpha 2 came into collision with the asteroids. Well, then? Alpha 2 has changed her course by six degrees in respect to Vega. I'm afraid she'll enter orbit around the Earth before the estimated time. Can you ascertain her present position? Yes, I can. High coordinate, 27 degrees. Movement of ellipses gradually advancing. Look out! It's coming towards you! Yes, sir. It will be on top of us any minute. What about the men, Sullivan? They are all on standby, sir. Two mechanics went out of the space taxi to Solar Mirror Foxtrot 1 2. I ordered them not to come back. Commander, see if you can save them. Sullivan, save yourself. It's too late, sir. Sullivan! Sullivan! Can you hear me? Sullivan! What you're always saying to himself, 
Every man is a whole world. Commander, I've been able to locate the position of the space taxi. Hello, Command. Coordinate Pi 28, 8 degrees in respect to Aldebaran. We're changing course and we'll try to rescue the survivors. Bravo Zulu 88 to space taxi Bravo 91. We're coming in to rescue you. Be ready to bail out. Bravo Zulu 88 to space taxi Bravo 91. We're coming in to rescue you. Be ready to bail out. Out. says your boy should rest. No, Ray. Show them in here. I just wanted to see you, boys. Barry. Jackson. I'm glad to see you. Go and get some rest now. I'll start firing the rockets. Five thousand miles. Four thousand five hundred. Four thousand. Three thousand five hundred. Three thousand. It's disintegrated. I'll try again. Five thousand. Forty-five hundred. Four thousand. Three thousand. Twenty-five hundred. Two thousand. Fifteen hundred. One thousand. Nine hundred. Eight hundred. Going to make it. Seven hundred. Six hundred. Five hundred. Four hundred. Three hundred. Two hundred. Another rocket. I'm getting near it, sir. It's too dangerous, Al. Stop. You'll be attracted by the metallic field. I've located the channel. I'll try to break through it, Commander. I'm sure that I can get at least 1,500 miles away from the spaceship. Come back, Al. It's murder. I'm 2,000 miles away from Alpha 2 now, sir. Let me try. Al, oh, that's an order. I'm sorry, sir. But I'm not taking orders anymore. It's a useless sacrifice. Son, I'm 1,200 miles away from it. I don't want to disillusion you. But what would be the use of living if the Earth were destroyed? We'd all be prisoners of space with no hope of return. 800 miles. Al, please! After 200 miles, you'll have only a very slight chance to keep on a steady course. That slight chance challenges me to try. What you're doing? 
seconds I'll know for sure. succeeded in proving the existence of a channel by the sacrifice of his own life. But we still haven't got a chance. There's nothing for us to do but follow his lead. But how, Lucy? Commander, why don't you request more spaceships equipped with missiles? It's too late now. They'd never get here in time. that object that keeps appearing on the screen? It's the space taxi from the disintegrated satellite. It is now circling in orbit around us. The space taxi. I rode on it once for the hell. Are you afraid, Lucy? Yes, for him. I understand. I love him, George. I know. But love has no meaning anymore, George. Does it? Perhaps it's the only thing that does matter. The world of human feelings has been much less explored than the whole of the universe put together. But now it's late. What have we been doing all these thousands of years? We've been congratulating ourselves on our progress in going faster and faster and faster. When in reality, we've only been getting further away from ourselves. Take my place, will you? Where do you think you're going? Out, in the space taxi. That's madness. Maybe so, but it's not half as mad as the idea that brought us to this point. You are staying here. Listen, Lucy loves you. And Lucy has been and is everything in the world that matters to me. You may not understand it, but for that very reason, I will stop you from going to certain death. Why stop me? We are all going to get killed anyway. I'm going to stop you even if I have to use force.
I had to throw to the right and left any loose objects in the space taxi in order to judge the distance between the two curtains of disintegration. Look, it's insane. Plugs, transistors, the spare parts from the mechanics toolkit. George, I'm going to make it. I'll get through. Go on, Ray. Go on. You're nearly there. I'm listening. Get into the pilot seat and disconnect the electronic brain. It should be on the left-hand panel. Turn off everything else. The pilot's still inside the hibernation cell. Dead. Disconnect all contacts on the left-hand panel. disconnected the electronic brain Ray you must disconnect the electronic brain I'm standing in front of it what should I do destroy it disconnect the cable Come loose. He can cut them. There are emergency tools right under the footrest of the pilot's seat. Did you hear, Ray? Under the footrest. All right. Quick. He'd better hurry, sir. We're entering the Earth's gravity zone. Our speed is increasing. Use a pair of wire cutters. Them, George. Now I'll cut the wires. I'm cutting through the last wire. The raised deflector has stopped. Maybe we've made it. How can you prove that the photonic field has been disintegrated? There's only one way of telling for certain. We're coming in. Five thousand. 
We're getting through it. Ray, we're coming. The nightmare is over. inside the ship. Earth Base 9. Earth Base 9. Earth Base 9 to Bravo Zulu 88. Can you hear us? Over. Bravo Zulu 88 to Earth Base 9. Go ahead. Are you all going insane up there? If you keep racing that fast, you'll disintegrate when you reach the Earth's atmosphere. Separate and change your course immediately. Alpha 2 is out of control. There's a man inside. We're going down to try to rescue him. Spacesuits on. Lucy, take my place. We'll manage. Longer. I can't control the oxygen flow. Use the regulator, Ray. I don't have it anymore. It was the last thing I threw out into space. Ray, you must hold out. Bravo Zulu 88. Bravo Zulu 88. Are you listening? Roger. Go ahead. This is an order from the high command. Stop rescue of Alpha 2 pilot. Change your course immediately, or you'll soon enter the atmosphere. Repeat, this is an order from the high command. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what would have happened if Ray... established contact again, and will stay as close as possible. Ray, we're very close now. The men now going out. Too much air. An orgy of air. My thoughts are running wild. Talk to me, Lucy. Everything is spinning. Where are you, Lucy? Beside you. Quick, the cold wave port here. What's the use of trying to save the world, Lucy? If, if I'm going to be lost myself. No. You can't say this, Ray. You believed more than any of us. Thank you. 